Chapter 1 The Marquis de Sade Gnosticism was an indirect attack on Christianity and God's sovereignty. This indirectness did not diminish in the least its very real enmity. The pattern of Gnostic groups from the beginning has been to present themselves as the true interpreters of the hidden meaning of Christianity. Thus, while radically at odds with Orthodox Christianity, the Gnostic cults have normally claimed to adhere to it and to reveal its true meaning. There was nothing indirect about the Marquis de Sade. His attack on Christianity was as direct as possible. The Enlightenment, a European movement, began in England in the time of Charles II, 1660 on. Its roots, however, were deep in the medieval centuries. The Enlightenment shifted the centre of interest from God to man and from the church to the state, except in the German states where the university gained centrality. The intellectuals, the self-styled men of reason, saw themselves as the prophets of the new order of the ages. In time, too, the performing arts replaced the mass and the church service. Man was now the measure of all things, and it was man's will that needed to be done. With man in charge, progress was held to be inevitable, and it was only a question of time before a utopia would be achieved. Enlightenment humanism began with the, quote, moral baggage, end quote, of its context, Christendom, but in practice, it steadily stripped off all morality in favour of self-enjoyment. At the same time, being at war with God, profanation became a prized pleasure. John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester, 1647-1680, to was a profligate who, in denying God, denied the possibility of humanity becoming moral and truly honest. Quote, Thus, here you see what human nature craves. Most men are cowards. All men should be knaves. The difference lies, as far as I can see, not in the thing itself, but the degree. And all the subject matter of debate is only who's a knave of the first rate. End quote. Humanism begins by affirming the natural goodness of all men as against the biblical doctrines of the fall and man's depravity. It affirms the sovereignty of goodness, truth and beauty and their prevalence and preeminence among men. Before long it despises these things in favour of their reverse. Gaining sexual licence instead of enjoying sex, held to be beautiful and good at first, is polluted in as many ways as possible. The Restoration poet John Collop, 1625-1661, was extravagant in his praise of both Charles I and Charles II, whom he claimed was greater than Charlemagne, holding, in Conrad Hilbury's words, Charles II to be, quote, a very Christ, appearing in his thirtieth year to reform England, end quote. This is in line with Collop's part in the Baroque genre in praise of an ugly or a deformed mistress. Collop praised women, ageing and in decay, with bad teeth, a bowed back, overweight and so on. The contempt for beauty meant the praise of its opposites. For Collop, as for Thomas Hobbes, quote, Political power is a matter of force, not right. End quote. For him, quote, The greatest injury is the greatest right. End quote. Because it is clearly triumphant. Clearly, the moral universe was being turned upside down. The courts of Europe from 1660 to 1800 practiced this new way of life. More than a few scholars have pointed out that such courtly practices far exceeded Sad's own acts. Of course, Sad spent so much of his life in prison that his sexual activity was accordingly restricted. The pleasure in sin was a passion of the times. In Sad, it was an obsession. Moreover, Sad was at all times and in all things in total war against God. The dominating motive of Sad's life was his war against God. Because the Bible told him that man is made in God's image, Sad had to do everything to defame and deface that image in his intense hatred of God. As Simone de Beauvoir pointed out, Sad openly acknowledged his coprophilia. 
The action in Sad's writings is always anti-God and then anti-man. It was as a student that I learned from my reading what was later confirmed to me by a few who dealt with mental patients, namely, that the hatred of God is so intense with some that they eat feces to defile God's image in them. Their hatred of God is personal, physical and violent. Sad chose Easter Day to whip Rose Keller. His life and his writings were an unceasing act of war against God. Beauvoir saw Sad's hatred against God and his creation as she cited these words of Sad. Quote, Ah, how many times by God have I not longed to be able to assail the sun, snatch it out of the universe, make a general darkness, or use that star to burn the world? Oh, that would be a crime. End quote. Above all, Sad's enemy was God. Quote, the idea of God is the sole wrong for which I cannot forgive mankind. End quote. Like Camus after him, Sad chose evil because God is good. He chose filth, corruption, horror and villainy because they were the antithesis of the good and the holy. Sad willed the death of God for himself. He saw not a universal harmony of interests, but a cosmic conflict of interests. Quote, My neighbour is nothing to me. There is not the slightest relationship between him and myself. End quote. Sad was also always marked by a will to death. He wrote, quote, The principle of life and all beings is no other than the death principle. End quote. According to Richard Seaver and Austrian Wienhaus, quote, Sad sought condemnation. End quote. More honestly stated, we would have to say that Sad sought hell. For him, man is depraved and the human race should be allowed to die out. Sad held that all things worked together for evil. He hated fertility, advocated birth control and wanted, as we have seen, universal death. Pleasure, he held, must be solitary and there is joy in oppressing others. The world, Sad held, is overpopulated, or at least France was. He was against all laws restricting the freedom to do evil. Each woman, quote, must belong to all who claim her, end quote. Marriage had to be destroyed. Perversions were urged as a prevention of births. For Sad, man's heart, being totally evil, was the infallible moral authority. Sad, a homosexual, favoured abortion and infanticide. Cruelty was for him a consummate form of pleasure. He referred to Satan as the, quote, one and unique God of my soul, end quote. Sad set forth his thinking perhaps most clearly in a pamphlet inserted into his, quote, philosophy in the bedroom, end quote. Its title, Yet Another Effort, Frenchmen, If You Would Become Republicans, calls for a great effort to complete the French Revolution. Christianity must be eliminated and theft incest, sodomy and murder tolerated. As Lyndhurst pointed out for Edmund Burke in Reflections on the Revolution in France, 1790, this was a logical conclusion to, quote, this new conquering empire of light and reason, end quote. Because Sad was so consistently evil, he was more logical than most evil men and most churchmen, whose inconsistent profession of Christianity blurs their vision badly. Sad's fundamental premise in, quote, yet another effort, Frenchmen, was simply this. Having abandoned Christianity, men should therefore logically abandon all law. Quote, for what should we, who have no religion, do with law? End quote. Law being the will of the sovereign, to abandon God as sovereign means to abandon his law. And if man is now sovereign, how can there be any law over man? Is not man's will the only law? The French Revolution, Sad hoped, had also dethroned Caesar and should abandon the state. Quote, Annihilate forever what may one day destroy your work. End quote. Men should follow, quote, Nature equally dictating vices and virtues to us. 
end quote. Equality, he told the revolutionists, is, quote, that foremost law of your new government, end quote. The morality of love for one's neighbour was, for sad, absurd. Sad opposed capital punishment and laws against murder. The only proper morality for a republican government was its self-perpetuation. One can add that it was to exist to prevent the existence of Christianity and its laws. Republican manners required immorality to demonstrate equality. All women should be the property of all men. There should be no exclusiveness in any sphere of life. He held that he had the right of possession over any woman and, quote, I have incontestable rights to the enjoyment of her. I have the right to force from her this enjoyment if she refuse me it for whatever the cause may be, end quote. This should be true of females from their early years. Sad favoured incest, he wanted it made into law, and also sodomy. Savages are closest to nature and the most ferocious, as all should be, Sad believed. Child killing to avoid, quote, overpopulation, end quote, he also favoured. According to Simone de Beauvoir, sodomy was central to Sad's thinking, quote, there is no perversion of which he speaks so often and with so much satisfaction and even impassioned vehemence. End quote. There is no evidence, he wrote, that Sad ever engaged in normal sexuality. Max Stirner, in his The Ego and His Own, clearly followed Sad in his view of God, law, and morality. A Sadean man of wimpish traits in the 20th century was Salvador Dali, the artist. Sadian thinking has been an underground movement in history since his time, but perhaps in part because of Sad's counsel in Juliette. Quote, True wisdom, my dear Juliette, does not consist in repressing our vices, because since these vices constitute almost the only happiness in our life, to wish to repress them would be to become our own executioners. But it consists in abandoning ourselves to them with such secrecy and such extensiveness that we may never be caught out. Do not be afraid that this may diminish their delight. Mystery adds to the pleasure. Moreover, such behaviour ensures impunity, and is not impunity the most delicious nourishment of debauchery? End quote. The world of sad is all around us. It colours our media, television and the films. It is an undercurrent in modern life. It appears, for example, in the coprophiliac plus activities of a prominent, quote, rock star, end quote. It is present everywhere in what Gallagher has aptly termed our pornographic culture, in which sex is separated from the family and procreation and reduced to irresponsible pleasure. Modern sexual repression bars honest treatments of sexuality and has made sexual androgyny, quote, the dominant cultural message, end quote, Lynn Hunt's book gives us much evidence about our, our revolution. Prior to the French Revolution, the family provided the pattern for society. Rulers were the fathers of their countries. Parental respect was given to all authorities, and the professed goal of society was to be bound together as a family. Though often abused, this ideal had, over the centuries, also provided nations with a cohesive premise. The French Revolution was preceded by a pornographic assault on the monarchy. It concentrated at first on the Queen, Marie Antoinette, and then on King Louis XVI. Books with pornographic illustrations abounded. The premise of the revolutionary writers was not respect authority, but, like the logo on a T-shirt I saw not long ago, fuck authority. Basic to the French Revolution, according to Lynn Hunt, was, quote, the underlying interconnections between pornography and politics, end quote. We miss the meaning of much of the 20th century if we neglect the relationship between the, quote, hard, end quote, and, quote, soft, end quote, pornography of our time and the spirit of revolution. Its premise is also that of the Marquis de Sade. Abolish God and law, reduce all things to equality, and man will then be free to enjoy himself. 
Against all this, an antinomian church is helpless. Those who, while professing to believe the Bible, are antinomian, have already yielded the essentials. A God who is not sovereign and therefore not the source of law is hardly God at all. The modernists openly surrender the biblical doctrine of God and God's law, so they begin in Sad's camp. Should we be surprised that antinomian pastors and priests are so much involved in homosexuality, child molestation and adultery and often have a taste for pornography? Some years ago, when Nud Rasmussen asked an Igluglug Inuit wise man what his people believed, he was told, quote, What do we believe? We don't believe. We only fear. End quote. We have today two groups in the 20th century world, those who only fear and those who live only to enjoy their sedean desires. There is no future for either of them. We need to say with a psalmist, It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Psalm 119, 126. Moreover, we need to take our stand with the triumphant men of old who said, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Psalm 118, 17, 